Well, if we think about the search for extraterrestrial life until today, in a sense it's been a mixture of extreme optimism and underlying pessimism. So we have discovered really in the last 10 years that there's a uh, dramatically large number of so-called extrasolar planets, many more than were perhaps suspected, and it's now clear that some of those are within what astronomers call the habitable zone, which means more or less there'll be ice and steam, but also liquid water where life can presumably flourish. And now that we have the new information, which is going to be augmented very dramatically in the next uh, 10 years, then we'll have some idea whether, in fact, planets will have life on them. Combined, of course, with that has been the radio telescope initiatives, which are being listening out there in the hope of finding some detectable signal, which is clearly not of natural origins. And that's really where the short straw has been drawn. It seems from that perspective that things are embarrassingly quiet. So in a sense we have a tension, we have new information from the planet so we can actually begin to target where we'd like to look. And all the time, if you like, we have not quite a cyclops, but we have this system of listening out into our galaxy, in fact beyond, hoping one day that a signal will come in. The existing research programs looking for extraterrestrial life effectively are combining information from the detection of so-called extrasolar planets. These, with few exceptions, can't yet be imaged directly effectively because a star is very bright and the planet which is very close to it, many light years away, is actually very dim. But even that is changing rapidly. And this will allow us to actually say that solar system, let us say 30 light years away, has eight planets and two of them actually are like the Earth. So in that case one might say, well maybe instead of having an all-sky survey which the radio astronomers have been doing when they've been trying to listen, mostly, if you like, on a piggyback fashion. Radio astronomers are far too clever and busy to spend all their time looking for extraterrestrial life. But every now and again something comes in which is anomalous, but if we could actually target our search, and of course the assumption is that the aliens, if they exist, will be employing methods of communication like ours, then one might begin to have a more targeted search. And scientists, I have to say, do like targeted searches. Um, aliens, according to some people, will be genuinely alien. In fact, as I've mentioned elsewhere, it might be that perhaps many, many centuries in the future we come back from an expedition and we give something to a mineralogist and then he rings us up the next day and says, by the way, you've just brought back an alien. In other words, it may be so different from what we expect that we will really have to throw away all our assumptions. I, uh, perhaps because I work in Cambridge and therefore very, very conservative, no, no, it's not quite like that, but I am more conservative because I think evolution by and large is constrained. Uh, to some extent, my colleagues would agree with me. They would say, for the most part, not everybody, that life really has to, as NASA has said, follow the water. And it's also got to be based on carbon. Carbon's wonderfully versatile because it forms chains of and rings and all that sort of thing. Other people say maybe silica-based life, but for various reasons I think that's less likely. But I would go much further than that because I would argue that effectively life has so few options that in fact if you want to learn how to swim, how to fly, how to walk, if you want to learn how to breathe, if you want to even learn how to reproduce even things which go down to rather subtle business about why we have sexes and things like that, even the nature of the chromosomes on this planet actually have various sorts of predictabilities about them. And I'm taking a gamble here, and most likely I will never know, because if we ever do detect alien life, it may be centuries away, even now. But I think that when we do detect alien life, it will be, well, strikingly, embarrassingly, well, it will be like us. If we look at this planet, there are a number of possible implications for the predictability of evolution, which again might have a bearing on alien life. And one of them, of course, is that we might begin to wonder, where else can life go? What else can it do? And there is a few suggestions. Actually, there isn't much more it can do. And linked to that, there's also the possibility that, in fact, life probably is almost as good as it's ever going to get. There is some evidence that things are as, well, almost optimal, which, again, doesn't necessarily fit easily with some Darwinian perspectives. But far beyond that, and by far the most interesting, of course, is that we have the evolution of the nervous system, big brains, technology. Of course, that's the crucial difference, and that's where science comes in, because so far as we're concerned, our species, from one perspective, is completely different. Of course, we have language, we have technology, we have culture. You have elements of that in other animals, like crows, even octopus on occasion. But we are now changing the world forever, and we are understanding the universe in a way which no other species ever could. And in that way, I think you might say, well, evolution has run out of things to do so far as, if you like, natural selection is concerned. But I think in terms of the future, uh, the way in which we're going to understand the world, then in fact, I mean, in that way, really all bets are off again. It's incredibly exciting.